Peace be with you. Welcome back, brothers and sisters. Welcome to Jesus via Mary. The best, surest, and the quickest way to the sacred heart of Jesus is through his mother, the Blessed Virgin, the Immaculate Conception. She's our mother too. Mary, our mother. Let's begin with a prayer. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that any one who fled to your protection, implored your help, or sought your intercession was left unaided. Inspired with this confidence, we fly unto you, O Virgin of Virgins, our Mother. To you do we come, before you we stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, Despise not my petitions, but in your mercy, hear and answer them. Amen. Hello again, brothers and sisters. We, last week, started talking about the Passion, because it's getting close to Good Friday. There are only a couple of weeks left. And we talked about the Last Supper, the arrest of Jesus, and the agony in the garden. Actually, the arrest came after the agony. Today we're going to start talking to you about the scourging at the pillar and the agony of the Mother of God. We'll also continue talking about the crowning with thorns. And then next week we'll move into the crucifixion. We have a lot of material to cover, so without further ado, let's begin. There were six scourgers, dark, swarthy men, all somewhat shorter than Jesus. Their loins were girded, and the rest of their clothing consisted of a leather jacket, open at the sides and covering the upper part of the body like a scapular. They were evil men, from the frontiers of Egypt, who had been condemned for their crimes to hard labor and were employed in erecting public buildings, the most criminal of them being selected to act as executioners in the praetorium. These barbarous men had scourged poor criminals to death many times at this same pillar. They resembled wild beasts or demons and appeared to be half drunk. Although he followed without offering the least resistance, They struck our Lord with their fists and dragged him by the cords to the pillar to which he was pinioned. Then they barbarously knocked him down against the pillar. This pillar stood alone in the center of the court and did not serve to sustain any part of the building. It was not very high, for a tall man could touch the top by stretching out his arms. There was a large iron ring at the top, It is quite impossible to describe the cruelty and barbarity shown by these ruffians toward Jesus during that short walk to the pillar. They tore his mantle from him, with which he had been clothed at the court of Herod, and almost threw him to the ground. Jesus trembled and shuddered before the pillar, and took off the rest of his garments as quickly as he could, but his hands were bloody and swollen. He prayed ever so touchingly, and for an instant turned his face towards his most afflicted mother, who was standing, overcome with grief, with the holy women in a corner of one of the porches around the square, not far from the scourging place. This look of his unnerved her. She fainted, and would have fallen if the holy women had not supported her. Jesus put his arms around the pillar, and when his hands were thus raised, the scourgers fastened them to the iron ring, which was at the top of the pillar. Then they pulled his arms to its height, and in so doing they stretched his whole body, so that his feet, tightly bound at the base, barely touched the ground. Jesus was writhing like a worm under the brutal whipping of these barbarians. They resounded through the air, the whips forming a kind of touching accompaniment 
to the hissing of the instruments of torture, and his deep groans could be heard from afar. The clamor of the Pharisees and the people formed another kind of accompaniment, which at times deadened and smothered his sacred and mournful cries. Meanwhile, Pilate continued parleying and negotiating with the people, and when he demanded silence in order to be able to speak, at such moments you might again hear the noise of the scourges, the moans of Jesus, and the blasphemies of the soldiers, and also the bleeding of the paschal lambs which were being washed in the pool near the sheep gate for the coming festival of Passover. There was something peculiarly touching about the plain of bleeding of these lambs as they alone appeared to unite their lamentations with the suffering moans of the true Lamb of God. The two ruffians continued to strike him with unremitting violence for a quarter of an hour and were then succeeded by two others. Jesus' body was entirely covered with black, blue, and red marks. His sacred blood was trickling down on the ground. He trembled and shuddered, and yet furious cries issued from the assembled crowds who showed that their cruelty was far from being satiated. A second pair of executioners then commenced scourging Jesus with the greatest possible fury. They made use of a different kind of rod, set with thorns and covered with knots and splinters. This time the blows from these sticks tore his flesh to pieces, and his blood spouted out so that the arms of the scourgers were sprinkled with it. Jesus moaned and prayed and shuddered in his agony. Then two more new executioners took their place, took the place of the former. Their scourging instruments were composed of small chains or straps covered with iron hooks which penetrated to the bone and tore off large pieces of flesh at every blow. Who can describe the awful barbarity of that spectacle? They untied Jesus, turned him around, and again fastened him, this time with his back to the pillar. As he was totally unable to support himself in an upright position, they passed cords around his waist, under his arms and above his knees, and having once more bound his hands tightly into the rings which were placed at the upper part of the pillar, they recommenced scourging him with even greater fury than before, and one among them hit him constantly on the face with a rod. By now the body of our Lord was perfectly torn to shreds. It was but one huge wound. He looked at his torturers with eyes filled with blood, as if entreating mercy. But their brutality appeared to increase, and each moment his moans became more and more feeble. The dreadful scourging had been continued without intermission for three-quarters of an hour. During these forty-five minutes the Blessed Virgin witnessed the scourging of her Divine Son. In her interrupted ecstasy during the time of the scourging, I saw her. She suffered with inexpressible love and grief all the torments he was enduring. She groaned feebly, and her eyes were red with weeping. She wore a long blue robe partly covered by a cloak made of white wool, and her veil was of a creamy white color. At the termination of the scourging, she came to herself for a time and saw her divine son torn and mangled, being led away by his torturers after the scourging. With his garment he wiped his eyes, which were filled with blood, so that he might see his mother. It was heartbreaking to see her stretch out her hands towards him, in agony. When the cords that bound Jesus were eventually cut, he sank, covered with blood, at the foot of the pillar and lay unconscious in his own blood. The executioners then left him lying there and went to drink, while their villainous companions were weaving the crown of thorns. The executioners 
again returned, and kicking Jesus with their feet, forced him to rise, for they had not yet finished with him. They struck him while he crawled after his linen girdle, which the wicked wretches kicked away from side to side, so that, like a worm, he had to crawl around on the ground in his own blood in order to reach the girdle, and with it cover his severely lacerated loins. When he was driven into the praetorium after the scourging to submit to the crowning with thorns, he wiped the blood from his eyes in order to see his afflicted mother again. As he passed, she lifted her hands again towards him in agony and gazed after him and his blood-stained footsteps. By special favor of the Lord, the Blessed Virgin was able to see visions of everything that happened to her divine son during his passion. Then she was able to cooperate with him in his redeeming suffering for mankind by uniting the prayers and sacrifices of her Immaculate Heart to those of his Sacred Heart. Indeed, Throughout the Passion, our Lord derived most of his consolation from the love and holiness of his mother. When the Savior and his apostles left the Cenacle after the Last Supper for Gethsemane, the Blessed Virgin had gone to the home of Mary Mark with Magdalene and several of the holy women. On the way they met Lazarus, Nicodemus, and Joseph of Arimathea, who reported that they knew of no immediate steps being planned against Jesus. But Mary described to them Judas' sudden departure from the cenacle, and she expressed her fear that he intended to betray Jesus that very same night. Actually, she had witnessed in a vision the plotting of Jews, Judas and the Pharisees. As Jesus began to pray in the Garden of Gethsemane that night, his mother likewise retired to a private room and begged the Eternal Father that she might be allowed to feel all the physical and spiritual pain and torture which her son was about to undergo. The Holy Trinity granted her prayer. Indeed, when the soldiers arrested and bound Jesus, she also felt on her wrists the same pain caused by the ropes and chains on his flesh. Similarly, she felt on her delicate body all the blows and kicks and falls which he suffered while being dragged to the palace of the high priest. The Blessed Virgin went out into the dark streets with some friends as they wanted to find out what was going to be done to Jesus. They were then able to watch the procession of the guards and their victim from a distance. Mary was speechless with grief. Meanwhile, the little group of holy women tried to avoid the crowds that were gathering, and they were often obliged to hide in an alley when a band of Jesus' enemies passed by. In fact, several times Mary and her friends endured insults from women of loose character, and more than once they heard men curse or slander her son. They therefore led his mother along unfrequented routes in order to shun those by which Jesus was being dragged, and so spare her the anguish of meeting him. What a sad sight it was to see the mother pierced with such anguish, and hurrying through the streets at midnight with the holy women, from one friend's house to another, their hearts beating with fear at being out at so unusual an hour. More than once they heard bitter, malicious remarks against her son, and rarely a compassionate word. Then the holy women went to the home of Lazarus' sister, Martha. This was in the western part of the city where John met them and told them all that had happened since Jesus left the cenacle. They were deeply upset and each tried to help console one another. At intervals, other messengers came and knocked lightly at the door, bringing further discouraging news. Mary Magdalene, who was almost out of her mind with grief, staggered with the others through the moonlit streets, sobbing and wringing her hands. Again they were frequently insulted by the enemies of Jesus. 
The Blessed Virgin endured this all in silence, like her divine son, who at the same moment was being mocked and struck in the high priest's palace. But her inner suffering, in sympathy with him, was so intense that occasionally her companions had to support her in their arms. Once, however, when they met a friendly group, who greeted Mary as the most unhappy and afflicted mother of the Holy One of Israel, the Blessed Virgin thanked them earnestly for their kindness. Near the palace of Caiaphas they had to pass by a yard where some cursing laborers were hammering away at the cross for the newly condemned criminal. Eventually she was led by John to a spot where she could hear the sights, hear the sighs of Jesus and the insults and blows that he was enduring. However, some men in the crowd coming out of the palace recognized her and exclaimed loudly, Isn't that the Galilean's mother? Her son will certainly be crucified, but not until after the festival, unless he is really the greatest of criminals. As Jesus was dragged to a filthy underground prison cell to spend the hours until dawn, Mary and the holy women sadly returned to Martha's home. After sunrise the next morning, Caiaphas sent Jesus to Pilate, but although John warned the Blessed Virgin that it would break her heart to see her son after he had been so defiled and disfigured as to be nearly recognizable, Mary took her mantle and veil and said solemnly, Let us follow my son to Pilate. My eyes must see him again. But in the crowded streets she had to listen repeatedly to the cruel comments of hard-hearted people concerning the guilt and fate of her son. Then suddenly at a sharp turn in the street she came upon the procession. At last she saw Jesus again. But now he was staggering along, bound and chained, covered with bruises and saliva, constantly being jerked forward by the ropes which his merciless guards held. But through it all he remained a meek and silent victim, humbly submitting to a storm of inhumane mockery, curses, and insults. For a second, so unrecognizable was he, Mary was utterly shocked, so much so that she gasped, Is this my son? Oh, Jesus, my Jesus! Then she suddenly prostrated herself on the ground in reparation to his desecrated divinity. When he passed close by her, Mother and son exchanged a brief look, charged with such an indescribably great and heart-rending mutual love and compassion. Following bravely after Jesus, Mary came to the palace of Pilate, and from the corner of the forum she witnessed the first Roman trial. As she saw with what furious hatred the enemies of Christ attacked him and mercilessly sought his death, she held her mantle before her face and quietly, in the ultimate and extreme anguish of a mother whose love knew no bounds, wept tears of blood. When he was again brought before Pilate, the holy women heard a rumor that the Roman governor was trying to release Jesus. Trembling and shivering with all the hopes and fears of a mother, Mary's heart was cruelly torn between her natural desire for her son's safety and her supernatural submission to the word of God. But Pilate soon weakly yielded to the fury of the enemies of Jesus by freeing Barabbas and condemning the Galilean to be scourged. As the innocent victim was being stripped and attached to a pillar, for an instant he turned his head towards his mother, who was standing with the holy women not far from the scourging place. It seemed as though he was trying to say to her, Oh, mother, turn your eyes away from me. At this point Mary fainted in the arms of her companions and had to be led away. It was nine o'clock in the morning when the scourging was over. The Blessed Virgin and Magdalene approached the place of the scourging. They cast themselves on their knees and soaked up the sacred blood of Jesus with a cloth until not a trace of it 
could be found. In the middle of the court there stood a fragment of a pillar, and on it was placed a very low stool, which these cruel men maliciously covered with sharp stones and bits of broken flower pots. They then tore off the garment of Jesus, thereby opening all of his wounds, threw over his shoulders an old scarlet mantle, which had barely reached his knees, dragged him to the seat prepared, and violently pushed him down upon it, having first placed a crown of thorns upon his head. The crown of thorns was made of three branches plaited together, the largest part of the thorns being purposely turned towards his head in order to pierce it. Having first placed these twisted branches on his forehead, then they tied them tightly together at the back of the head, and no sooner was this accomplished to their satisfaction than they put a large reed into his hand doing all with derisive levity, as if they were really crowning him king. They then snatched the reed from his hand and struck his head so violently that his eyes were filled with blood. They knelt before him, ridiculed him, stuck out their tongue at him, spat in his face, and buffeted him, saying at the same time, Hail, King of the Jews! Then they threw down the stool with the sharp stones and potsherds, pulled him up again from the ground and painfully reseated him with the greatest possible force. This shameful scene was protracted a full half hour, and during the whole time the Roman soldiers continued to applaud and encourage the perpetration of still greater outrages. outrages. The cruel executioners then re-led Jesus to Pilate's palace with a scarlet cloak thrown over his shoulders, the crown of thorns on his head, and the reed in his fettered hand. He was thoroughly unrecognizable, his eyes, mouth, and beard being covered with blood, his body but one raw wound, and his back bowed down as that of an aged man, while every limb trembled as he walked. When Pilate saw him standing at the entrance of his tribunal, even he was startled with compassion, while the barbarous priest and the people, far from being moved to pity, continued their insults and mockery. When Jesus was ascending the stairs, Pilate came forward, and the trumpet was sounded to announce that the governor was about to speak. He addressed the chief priests and the bystanders. Behold, I bring him forth to you, that you may know that I find no cause in him. The scourgers then led Jesus up to Pilate, so that the people might again feast their cruel eyes on him, and the state of degradation into which he was reduced. Terrible and heart-rending indeed was the spectacle he presented, and an exclamation of horror burst forth from the multitude, followed by dead silence when he, with difficulty, raised his wounded head, crowned as it was with thorns, and cast his exhausted glance on the excited throng. People then exclaimed as he pointed to him, Ecce homo, behold the man. But the hatred of the high priest and their followers was, as if possible, increased at the sight of Jesus, and they cried out repeatedly, Crucify him, crucify him. Meanwhile Jesus, the scarlet cloak of derision thrown upon his lacerated body, his head pierced, sinking under the weight of the crowny thorns, his hands fettered, holding the mock scepter, was standing thus before Pilate, like a helpless lamb. Pilate then sounded the trumpet to demand silence, and said, Take him yourself and crucify him, for I find no cause in him. They said, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. These words revived the fears of Pilate. He took Jesus into another room and asked him, Who are you? Jesus made no answer. Speak you not to me, said Pilate. Do you not know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? You should not have any power against me, replied Jesus unless it were given to you from above. 
Therefore he who has delivered me to you has the greater sin. Pilate was half frightened, but at the same time also half angry at the words of Jesus. He returned to the balcony and again declared that he would release Jesus, but they cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. For whomsoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. And the cry, Crucify him, crucify him, resounded on all sides. Pilate then took water and washed his hands before the people, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just man. Look you to it. A frightful and unanimous cry then came from the dense multitude who assembled from all parts of Palestine. His blood be upon us and upon our children, they cried. This iniquitous sentence against the innocent lamb was given about ten o'clock in the morning. On hearing this, Mary, the mother of Jesus, became unconscious for a few moments, as she was now certain that her beloved son must die, must die the most ignominious and the most painful of all deaths. John and the holy women then carried her away to prevent the heartless beings who surrounded them from adding crime to crime by jeering at her grief. But no sooner did she revive a little then she begged to be taken again to a spot which had been sanctified by the sufferings and blood of her son in order to bedew them with her tears. Well, we'll stop there for today, brothers and sisters. We're just about out of time. Uh, as a side note, I'd like to let you know that the criminal they released in place of Jesus, whom they called uh, Barabbas, that was not his, uh, his real name. His real name was, well, I don't know what his real name was, but Barabbas means son of God. B-A-R means son of, and Abbas is really Abba, which is a Jewish name in those days, an affectionate name, might, just like we would use daddy. So Bar Abba is son of God, and that was just a further insult to Jesus, who was the true son of God, and is the true son of God. So I just wanted to share that with you. Another thing I found out when I was in the Holy Land last August in 2013 that the prison in which they held Jesus during the night was nothing more than a hole in the ground. And they had his tie, hands tied behind him and pulled tightly so that it was excruciating for him. He had to stand and he had to stand on the balls of his feet. If he tried to relax his feet and put the heels down it put more pressure on his arms, which were really stretched very far behind him. So he got no sleep that night, on top of all that he had already been through, and everything that he yet had to face. Okay, I hope you're enjoying our uh, talk about the Passion. We'll continue again next week, and we hope that you'll keep us in your prayers in the meantime. Let's say a quick Hail Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee, and for those who do not have recourse to thee. All right, brothers and sisters, we'll see you next time, same time, same station. Please keep us in your prayers, and we'll be praying for you. And remember, we want to be with you, and you know where to find us. Take care now, and God bless.